you understand the difference between a physical and a chemical change, right? In a physical change, you have the same material, but with a new set of conditions imposed upon it, it has a different set of physical attributes. You take ice and you add heat, it melts. Ice and liquid water are different. They have different physical attributes, but you know, they're still the same material. Down on the molecular level, you still have H2O. During a chemical change, a new material has been formed because the atoms have changed partners, they've rearranged, and that makes all the difference. So a chemical change involves the formation of a new material. Now, you may understand the difference between a physical and chemical change, but it's still tricky to be able to distinguish between the two in the laboratory or wherever you are. To look at a change and to decipher whether that change is physical or chemical, it's not so easy always to tell because both the physical change and a chemical change involve a change in the physical attributes. Hey, going from iron to rust is clearly an example of a chemical change. But you know, iron and rust, they look quite a bit different. The physical attributes of iron, the physical attributes of rust are different. There's a change in physical attributes, but not because of any physical change. It's because of chemical changes that have gone on. To distinguish between the two, you've got to look for evidence that suggests one or the other, you see. And that's what I want to show you here now, is types of evidence that make it look like it's a physical, and other types of evidence that make it look like it might be a chemical change. First up, for a physical change, we find it's fairly easy to reverse. All you need to do is go back to the original conditions you had, and you'll end up with the same set of physical attributes. The ice melts, take heat away, it'll freeze again, and you can go back and forth fairly readily. Here's another example, one that I can show you. I've got a balloon down here, and inside the balloon is air. And the air has a certain amount of volume it occupies, and that's one of its physical attributes. What I'm going to do is I'm going to change the conditions. I'm going to cool it down substantially to the point that the air turns into a liquid phase. I can do that by submerging it into here. It's very cold in there. Very cold. So cold that the air transforms into yeah, a liquid phase. I can even take another balloon. What kind of change is going on there? Well, what I'm saying is, if that the change is easy to reverse, it should be physical, or it indicates that it's a physical change. So we had it as a liquid, and we see it occupies much less volume as the liquid boils inside the balloon. Yeah, gives rise to the gaseous phase, which occupies much more volume, right? Beautiful. An example of a physical change. Now, I've got a demonstration here that aptly shows the differences between physical and chemical changes. And pay close attention. I'm going to heat up these materials and I've got these two materials, uh, the yellow one first. And we look at its physical properties. It's yellow, it's solid, all right? It's about how we can measure right now. I'm going to heat it up though. I'm going to change the conditions. And we'll look for signs of, of, of a change. Oh, I can see it already. There's a change in color. It's going from a canary yellow to this orange color. And I ask myself, self, I ask, is that orange material a new material? If so, that means we're witnessing here a chemical change. Hmm. If that orange is the same material, however, then we've got just a physical change. But just by looking at the change from yellow to orange isn't quite enough information to tell me whether it's one or the other. It could be either. Huh. Hey, it's not always clear cut whether it's a physical or chemical change. Ooh, but check this out. The colors are pretty darn close. 
What if I went from the yellow to the orange material by adding heat? Oh, that would be a hypothesis. Let me test that by adding heat to this orange material here. Gosh, I wonder if it would go back to the yellow. I w Ooh. We see that there's a lot of energy involved in this change. A lot of energy. You saw the fireworks going on in there, right? And that green stuff, hmm, to me, looks uniquely different from the orange stuff that we had. Oh, and look up here. If you look carefully, you can see that there's water formed, or at least I think perhaps it's water, condensed on the upper boundaries of the, of the test tube. Hmm, I wonder if this is ever going to go back to the orange material. You know what? I don't think so. Chemical changes we find on a gram per gram basis involve a lot more energy. When you take a firework and it blows up, a lot of energy there. When wood burns, a lot of energy there. On a gram per gram basis, chemical changes tend to involve more energy. And that is a good indicator that a chemical change is going on. Don't get me wrong, physical changes also involve energy. But on a gram per gram basis, chemical changes typically involve more. Oh, this is the other test tube we had. We originally heated it up. We started out with a, with a yellow material. And I'm looking at it. It's not quite as orange as we had it. it. Looks to me like it's turning back to the yellow color. Yeah, yeah. Check it out. Right up here. Right up here. It, it, it's yellow. It went back. Evidence suggests that this, indeed, was a physical change. And how about this? That the color of this material is a function of its temperature. Ah. So that's it. With a physical change, it's fairly easy to go back and forth. All you need to do is reset the original conditions. With a chemical change, however, oh, you have evidence that a new material has been formed. And going back to the original material, it's not going to be so straightforward as it is with a uh, physical change. And that's it. Good chemistry to you.